Thank you. Well, it's been an interesting evening, hasn't it? As Dexter Gordon said in Round Midnight, I'll have whatever he's having. This is the last one, so let's plow through this together, shall we? Back in 1957, a 10-year-old boy sat with his parents in Hirsch Memorial Coliseum in Shreveport, Louisiana, looking at a Lawrence Welk concert. The boy didn't care much for the music, but he sort of liked to watch the drummer, and in fact, he got the drummer's autograph after the show was over. The boy remembered seeing Lawrence Welk with a big smile on his face and a nun on each arm. The boy would take note of that for future reference. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with this uh, award, however. Ex except, except that about eight years later, the boy was back in the same Coliseum and he watched very attentively as uh, five lanky young men with very tight pants and bangs that almost covered their eyes ambled out on stage and began to play. And the boy sat mesmerized as his chiming strains of Mr. Tambourine Man floated out through the auditorium. And he experienced new and unfamiliar feelings as they sang a song called He Was a Friend of Mine about the murder of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. The ringing sound of the electric 12 string and the smooth, unusual harmonies the thought-provoking lyrics, all this underscored by the rock and roll drumming and the tight bass guitar lines combined into something completely different. It was a sound that the boy had never heard before. It was distant and yet it was familiar. And it struck a chord deep within him. This mysterious charismatic band sounded British. They sounded American. They sounded like folk. That's folk. They sounded like rock. There were jazz and country influences and even classical influences. They sounded pretty and they sounded ominous. They sounded hard and yet they sounded soft and gentle sometimes. And woven throughout all this was a mystical quality that made the boy dream of faraway places and different kinds of people and a different kind of life. Unfortunately, the group only got through three or four numbers that evening before they were mobbed by teeny boppers and had to leave the stage. But nevertheless, the boy's life had been changed forever. He wore out two copies of Mr. Tambourine Man that year. He used to play Don't Doubt Yourself, Babe, for his beautiful 15-year-old cheerleader girlfriend who sat and looked at him blankly like he had lost his mind. <laughs> but he was trying to give her a message. And the boys, if you didn't know by now, was me and the group was the birds. The year was 1965, and the course of American rock and roll had been changed, had been altered forever. The Beatles had invaded America. A man named Bob Dylan was writing music that was much more challenging and thought-provoking than popular songs had ever been up to that time. And there was now in the music something for the head as well as for the heart. And the birds were at the very center of this new movement. The Beatles had influenced them, and they in turn had fascinated the Beatles and Dylan had inspired both groups. And we perhaps take it for granted now, but it was a wonderful, magical time. Music was playing, hair was growing. <laughs> there were throngs of people in the streets, and the counterculture, which was the offspring of the beat generation, was being born. And the ethereal, mystical sound of the birds washed over them, washed over an entire nation and onto Britain and other parts of Europe. And it was a wake-up call for a new generation and a new era in rock and roll. The birds not only pioneered folk rock, but they went on to pioneer something called country rock as well. But I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> <clears throat> and just as an aside, I want to say that the mysticism and the transcendence and the peaceful spirituality and optimism of that kind of music is something that is sadly missing from the airwaves today. And in light of our present situation, we could really use some of it now. <laughs> In 
Nevertheless, they have left a rich and varied legacy, fortunately for all of us, and they continue to be productive today. And so it gives me extreme pleasure to welcome Monsieur McGuinn, Crosby, Hillman, Michael Clark, and Gene Clark into the Hall of Fame.